before we get started today, I would like to ask everyone for a moment of silence for Shireen Abu Akla and all those who paid the ultimate price on the road to equality and liberation. A moment of silence, please. Thank you. Shireen Abu Akla, a renowned journalist and a humanist. She was well known throughout the Middle East and she touched the lives of all Palestinians. Me included before she became a journalist. She was the daughter of Abu Tariq, a well-known travel agent. And she was a humanist that she knew everybody and everybody knew her and she was out there helping everybody. She was targeted and gunned down while she's doing her job of carrying and the truth and showing the true face to colonial settler Zionism and the occupation and the impunity by which the Israeli uh, defense ministry said that she was armed. These are not just journalists, they're armed. They're armed with cameras. They're armed with cameras to show the truth. So it is in her honor that we dedicate this conference. And this is the Shireen Abu Akla New Path to Peace Conference, May 2022. For the last hundred years, we have witnessed several attempts at a two state solution. And starting with the 1937 and uh, 1938, the Woodhead Commission and the Peel Commission, followed by the 1947 UN partition and culminating with the Oslo Accords that was signed between Israel and the PLO leadership. But today we find that we really, in, in reality, we have a one state one state where one group controls the lives and every aspect of daily lives of all Palestinians in all of Palestine. And it is, has been defined by Amnesty International and many before Amnesty International as an apartheid state. We welcome all of you our panelists and all of the attendees, because it is through your hard work and dedication to find the solution that is the rightful solution, a durable solution, a solution that will protect the rights of everyone as equal citizens. We in Richmonders for Peace in Israel, Palestine, reject any ideology that is exclusivist, no matter where it comes from. Palestine from the river to the sea for all of its citizens. And that is what we hope that this conference will highlight. And we will look forward to work with all of our panelists and our attendees to bring the, this ideas and their ideas to fruition. Thank you very much for joining us. And now I turn it to Reem Khalidi, our moderator for this panel, to introduce our esteemed panelists. 
Welcome all. Thank you, Adib, and uh, good morning to everyone. And uh, thanks for our panelists to uh, have time to join us today. Um, we have a great um, panel um, that uh, we're going to have a couple of things as far as logistics. Things to uh, mention before we start that all the Q&A will be um, taken care of after all the panelists have um, done their, their talks. And then we will have a uh, half hour uh, break between, uh, this is Eastern Standard Time, 12 to 12.30 for lunch. And then we will start the second panel at 12.30. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, uh, Dr. Alice um, Rothschild. And um, she, want to give you a little bit of introduction. Uh, she's a physician and author and filmmaker who focuses on human rights and social justice in Israel, Palestine. Uh, she practiced OBGYN and served as the assistant professor of OBGYN at Harvard Medical School. She writes and lectures widely in the, in the author of uh, books, including Broken Promises, Broken Dreams, Stories of Jewish and Palestinian Trauma and Resilience and Condition, uh, Life and Death in Israel and Palestine. She has contributed to a number of um, anthologies, the most recent being Reclaiming Judaism from Zionism, Stories of Personal Transformation. She directed a documentary film, Voices Across the Divine, and is active in Jewish Voice of Peace for Peace, and we um, are not numbered. So uh, welcome to um, the conference, and I'll give the, the floor to you. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I'm so happy to be here. Um, I've been tasked with uh, exploring why a two-state solution is no longer a viable option. And I'm gonna start out with some definitions, some history and some reflections. So first of all, when we talk about Israel, we're talking about just under 9 million people. 80% of them are Jewish. More than half of the Jews in Israel are Mizrahi Jews from Arab and Muslim countries. Um, and they have been chronically disadvantaged when compared to the Ashkenazi elite, the Ashkenazi are from Europe and also politically mobilized against Palestinian Arabs who in actuality share uh, much background and culture and language. And then a little over 20% of Israeli citizens are Palestinian. If we use the word Palestinian, we're talking about what I would call the Palestinians living in 48 Israel, the Israel along uh, the borders that were established after the first war, and then Palestinians in the occupied territories and the diaspora, which is almost 14 million people in the world, about 2 million in uh, Israel, a little over 3 million in the West Bank, and a little over 2 million in the Gaza Strip. So when you put all these numbers together and look at the region from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, it's about half Palestinian and half Jewish. And the two-state solution idea was based loosely on the partition line that was established in 48. So let's look at what you need to have to make a state. A state is a legal and political order. It's defined by territory, contiguous areas, defined borders. And I would argue that no one has a right to have a state. States occur as a result of war, um, occupation, aspirations, deals, economy, or diplomacy, all sorts of factors lead to becoming a state. On the other hand, a nation is a body of people who have a shared historical, cultural, ethnic, many different kinds of characteristics, and a nation has a right to self-determination. Now, historically, Jewish Zionists from the late 1800s made the goal of having a Jewish state central to their aspirations. And this started out as their response to European anti-Semitism. This all became interwoven with British colonialism, the Christian Zionism of uh, you know, Lord Balfour. They were all eager to, for all the Jews to go back to historic Palestine so they could have their rapture. And also uh, related to European anti-Semitism because many countries were eager to get rid of the Jews in their country, but it was easier if you gave them a place to go. So I would argue that the Jewish right to self-determination does not mean a Jewish right to statehood. Now, Palestinian liberation was linked to statehood, 
and their right to determine their political destiny and their existence as a nation became central, a central goal of the Palestinian national movement, particularly after the 1967 war and the UN resolution 242. And that's an important resolution to remember because it states that Israel should retreat from the territories it acquired in the 67 war. And then in 1971, the uh, PLO, the Palestinian, Liber Palestinian Liberation, or Palestine Liberation Organization, which is the only representative structure that includes all Palestinians everywhere, defined its goals to liberate historic Palestine from colonialism and establish a Palestinian state. And this idea was supported by the Arab League in 74, the 2020 Arab Peace Initiative, the 2003 Roadmap to Peace. But most importantly, as was mentioned, in the 1993 Oslo Accords, there was a pair of agreements between Israel and the PLO, first signed in Washington in 93, and then more things signed in Taba, Egypt in 95, that uh, started uh, what they called a peace process to establish some kind of Palestinian state uh, based on Resolution 242. But you have to remember, it was all within the context of Israeli military control. And I'm old enough to remember uh, a time when the two-state solution was considered a radical controversial idea, and then it became a very acceptable mainstream idea, and now it's pretty much been condemned by Israeli politicians as well as many Palestinians. And I think the two-state solution has largely persisted as a dominant paradigm because a more acceptable idea has not been reached, um, has not reached consensus among the people who are in power or their populations. And at the same time, polls show that less than half of Israelis now support a two-state solution and even a lower percentage of Palestinians. And on top of this, the US has never condemned the behaviors of Israel that have led to making a two-state solution untenable. So a component of a Palestinian statehood would include citizenship, sovereignty, contiguous land, borders, a recognition of the right of return for refugees, which is guaranteed under international law. So all of this discussion has to be articulated within the context of decolonization, because Israel was created and continues to function as a settler colonial state. So what happened to the two-state solution, which if you look at my country, it's become a kind of religion among uh, the Jewish population and members of the Democratic Party. And I think we have to be honest, the, the intent of the Israeli government was never, never, never to have a viable Palestinian state. Israel is a racist settler colonial project. Its country's policies are discriminatory towards its own Palestinian population, as well as toward the Mizrahi population, discriminatory towards Palestinians in the occupied territories. And Israel, like any other state, will not give up power voluntarily. So the Israel government has killed the two-state solution with its desire to maximize territory and to create Jewish demographic supremacy in the area. And the two-state uh, rhetoric has been just used to prolong occupation and colonization of the West Bank and East Jerusalem, and also to isolate Gaza. So if we take another look at the history, in 1948, Indigenous Palestinians were dispossessed of 78% of their land, 750,000 refugees were created, and this is uh, settler colonialism. As it's, Settler colonialism does not use the natives. It's not like the British in India. It, they want to get rid of the natives, so it's more like the United States or Australia or New Zealand. And then in 67, Israel occupied the remaining 22% and unilaterally declared Jerusalem its eternal united capital. So since that time, the Palestinians in the territories have been under permanent uh, military occupation. But going back to the founding of Israel, uh, Israelis have denied uh, Palestinians the right to exist as a nation. Now, the PLO agreed to the partition paradigm. In 1988, uh, they agreed to having a state in the West Bank and Gaza with Jerusalem as a capital. And this has resulted or produced a growing mistrust of the PLO years of hollow negotiations and disillusionment uh, by a large majority of Palestinians. And I like, I like to quote Saab Erekat, who was the former Secretary General of the PLO and a longtime negotiator. And he said, the two-state solution is not my position, it's my concession. Now, the Palestinian Authority, which is the Fatah-controlled governmental body that 
theoretically controls area A and B of the West Bank. And I say theoretically because the Israelis control everything. And area A and B are 55% approximately of the West Bank. They have failed to bring about liberation or justice. They've accepted negotiations with Israel on the basis of the Oslo Accords. And in a sense, they've become a collaborator with Israel, especially on security issues. And the PA spends more on security than on education and health combined. So what we see is that the peace process has been all process and no peace. 28 years later, Israel has prevented Palestinian construction and access to most of the land while building hundreds of illegal Jewish only settlements or colonies. They've continued to dispossess entire Palestinian neighborhoods and towns. They've developed a Jewish only infrastructure, which includes roads, parks, natural resource extraction. Jewish settlers and the military attack and kill Palestinians with almost total impunity, as we've seen with the tragic killing of Shirin Abu Akeh. And Human Rights Watch, B'Tselem, Amnesty International, the UN, a host of organizations and uh, people have detailed this as an uh, apartheid reality. And many have accused Israel of crimes against humanity. So we see that the Israeli government and military have taken irreversible steps that have made the two-state solution impossible. This expansion of Jewish-only settlements, the annexation of West Bank lands in addition to Jerusalem, the construction of the apartheid wall that mostly separates Palestinians from Palestinians, the blockade of the Gaza Strip, and the passing of the racist nation-state law by the Knesset, the Israeli parliament. In addition, the Palestinian Authority's political power is seriously undermined by all the internal divisions between Hamas and Fatah. And that has only created uh, Palestinian leadership, which in my opinion has been quite disastrous. Although on the grassroots level, in the boycott, divestment, sanction movement, in the academy, in popular resistance at the community and village level, in the prisons, there is a tremendous amount of mostly unrecognized leadership. In addition, I think the most serious recent threat to the two-state paradigm has been from the Israeli government itself and their enablers in the Trump and now Biden administration. I mean, Netanyahu made it clear that he would not allow the creation of a Palestinian state. And he was also even talking about more annexation. Prime Minister Bennett is to the right of Netanyahu. He will not meet with Palestinian leadership or work on anything even called a peace plan. So at this point, the two-state paradigm is barely a rhetorical framework, and it's definitely not an actual political intention. So the peace process did not end Israel's colonial domination. It led to the siege of Gaza, the massive increase in settler population, including East Jerusalem, the fragmentation of the Palestinian political entity with the creation of the PA, which superseded the PLO. It compromised the work of Palestinian liberation and the right of return. So the Palestinian state was designed to be a non-viable entity under Israeli hegemony. And Palestinians, not surprisingly, continue to resist this plan. So as was mentioned, currently what we have is a one state. It's an apartheid state with walls and settlements and discriminatory legal system that gives Israel the power over land, sea, and air supported by the US. And this is all compounded by the Israeli nation state law, which explicitly denies Palestinian national and cultural existence and is the latest iteration of dozens of laws enshrining the second class status of Palestinians within Israel since Israel's founding. And I would argue that a country that denies an indigenous population access to land, home ownership, residence in large parts of the country, prevents its access to employment, education, welfare benefits, denies its right to national or cultural self-determination, and even denies its political representatives the right to call for equality is no democracy. Israel is committed to being an ethno-national state. We have only to look at the race riots in Jerusalem, Israelis chanting death to the Arabs, their refusal to consider the right of return for Palestinians despite the law of return for Jews. And you have to remember that in a two-state solution, this would not change. And I think the final nail on the coffin was President Trump's Abraham Accord, quote, peace process, which officially fully re recognized Israeli control of Jerusalem, the West Bank colonies, all the vital resources, border security, officially rejected Palestinian right of return or having a military. So it was basically the status quo plus subjugation officially. 
It was dead on arrival, though it has been quite successful in gaslighting the Palestinian cause and in encouraging repressive Arab regimes to kind of snuggle up with Israel in exchange for massive amounts of uh, military arms. So the realities on the ground in the occupied territories are a colonial apartheid reality. The two-state solution does not include all the refugees, the right of return, and justice for those inside uh, Israel 48. So the question now is not how many states, but what kind of state? I would also like to end with two questions. If a state remains a violent and repressive entity, is that really the goal? Is a nation state inherently problematic if it defines citizenship on the basis of ethnicity rather than on territorial residency rights? And my final question for all of you is this increasingly uh, problematic thing, which is that in the US, and I think in Europe as well, support for Jewish state and political Zionism increasingly has been linked to white supremacists, to Christian Zionists awaiting the rapture, who love Israel as an ethno-nationalist, militaristic country that hates Arabs in general and Muslims in particular, while those same white supremacists hate Jews in particular because of their anti-Semitism, the, and the anti-Semitism now characterizes much of the fascistic movements that are growing in the US and elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rothschild, for this um, overview, um, historical overview of the um, situation. And uh, we have, uh, attendees that are asking questions, we're going to wait until the end of um, to and you know just to let the attendees know that um, we're going to get the Q and A at the end, but it will be we are not be able to get to all of your questions, but will, because of restriction of the time, but we will get to as many as we can. Um, but please um, put your questions in the Q and A uh, section chat of the uh, Zoom. So I am going to um, move on to our next um, speaker and um, Dr. Uh, Ramsey Baroud. And uh, Dr. Ramsey Baroud is a journalist and an editor of the Palestinian um, Palestine Chronicle. And he is the author of six books. His latest book co-edited with a Dr. Jan Pape is Our Vision for Liberation, Engaged Palestinian Leaders and intellectuals speak out. Dr. Baroud is a non-resident senior research fellow at the Center for Islam and Global Affairs. Um, welcome to our um, conference. I'll give the floor to you. Go ahead. Please. I think, thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, Reem, thank you uh, to Alice for her um, uh, opening remarks and, and excellent summary. and. And the questions that she raised um, at the end, I think these questions are particularly important. Um, as of late, I have been kind of witnessing a discussion regarding the very viability of the concept of the nation state period. This is a global discussion and it's not only relevant to Palestine, but it's prevalent, it's everywhere. And this is kind of the new hip thing to to discuss, did we make a mistake considering all of these things that are happening around the world and, and how nationalism, especially in the Western context, uh, kind of have undermined the very concept of the nation state, which till fairly recently, it seemed to have worked. Now for Palestinians, this is quite a contentious issue because what applies to Palestine, in fact, to the Middle East, in fact, to most of the global South, does not necessarily or is not necessarily an outcome of the political and historical processes that are underway in Europe. That doesn't mean that the discussion on nation state uh, moot entirely, but I think we have to differentiate between the concept of nation state and its success and failure, say in a Western context and in other contexts. Uh, particularly uh, uh, in Palestine, where the concept of the nation has been quite fundamental in creating that collective uh, energies and inspiring the collective struggles amongst Palestinians 
everywhere, everywhere you go in the world, there are Palestinians who are not only feeling members of a Palestinian nation, despite the fact that many of them don't even speak Arabic. So this is not even uh, a linguistic, you know, linked sense of nationhood. There is something bigger than that. Uh, in Palestine, the concept of the nation state is, is constantly linked to freedom, to self-determination, to justice, to roots, to culture, to history, to religion even. So I think we have to differentiate between the failure of the two-state solution as a political concept that was largely enshrined and, and promoted by Western institutions and between, and between the concept of the nation state as seen by Palestinians. And we have to be careful, if not a little bit kind, in how we try to push that idea amongst Palestinians. And by the way, if Palestinians don't buy the idea of the one state, no one will be able to actually promote it, uh, no matter how morally uh, or politically or rationally justifiable from the viewpoint of intellectuals for the time being, but perhaps even uh, politicians at one point in the future. Now back to the concept of, I was supposed to keep track of time and I just realized that I didn't. Um, um, I think it's very important that we um, kind of try to figure out some of these terminologies such as not the two state, but rather the word solution by itself. I think that has to be underlined a little bit here. And we need to pause uh, because the word solution, and that doesn't only apply to the two state solution, but to the one state solution or any kind of solutions that are imposed somehow on the Palestinians. Uh, even though I have been a strong supporter of the one state for a long time, I've always hesitated to win is the proper time to start championing this idea uh, um, anywhere in the world? And, and the answer was, and as long as there is no critical mass in Palestine itself, we have to be very careful trying to sell Palestinians ideas that are incepted in the West. Um, there are reasons behind that. And, and we know that the main reason behind it is that the West owns uh, so many tools. It's, it's, it's able to uh, impose itself it's well uh, through military means, through political means, through economic pressures and so forth. This is why it's very important that this idea of the one state takes place at a grassroots level in Palestine. And I've had many discussions and debate with my own Palestinian and Israeli friends regarding this particular issue. But the word solution itself here is a bit deceptive because it, it, it gives the impression that, that there is some good intentions on the part of, 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 of one or two or all the parties involved. That indeed it's, it's about coming up with this right formula that will be enticing enough, say for Israel, to be able to actually make that happen. Well, historically, this is completely untrue. There has really never been any real tangible, uh, attempts at securing a real viable, uh, as, as Alice said earlier, state for the Palestinians. It's always been a carrot, constantly dangled in front of the face of the Palestinians and Arabs and their supporters, that there is a political horizon. There is something worth striving for. What events on the grounds have always been the exact opposite. Events on the grounds have been those of constant Israeli uh, uh, Jewish settlement expansions in the West Bank, more restrictions on the Palestinians, uh, more support for Israel financially, uh, 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 more uh, suppression of any dis uh, dissident Palestinians or Palestinian political dissents initially by Israel, but eventually even by the Palestinian Authority itself, which, jo which initial job was to police the Palestinians on behalf of Israel. Um, if indeed the two states uh, were ever intended or was ever intended to be a solution, then how can someone explain the contradiction in Western behavior? How do you expect Israel to implement a two-state solution 
But at the same time, the United States and its Western allies and other benefactors continue to support Israel financially and militarily and continue to invest in the growth of the very illegal Jewish settlements that have been described even by the previous US administrations as obstacles to peace. It doesn't make any sense. So it's either American foreign policy makes absolutely no sense, uh, deranged and, 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 and um, is created by uh, men, mostly men, who have no real awareness of their action, or maybe the intention was something else entirely. And I think it's the latter, not the former. Um, the 1988 uh, was mentioned earlier by Alice, uh, in which the reference to the Palestinian PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, uh, making a commitment to accepting Israel's right to exist. Well, there were other things linked to that here. Yasser Arafat, that poor guy, I mean, he what he had to endure in order for him to secure a mere meeting with an American, a low level American official in Tunisia in 1988, how many hoops he had to jump not only accepting Israel's right to exist according, you know, Israel's right to exist, period, uh, with no Israeli commitment to the rights of the Palestinian people to exist, but he was forced to uh, condemn all kinds of terrorism and Palestinian violence, not Israeli violence, mind you. Uh, he was asked repeatedly to state these facts, uh, of course, accept UN resolution 242, uh, and 338 and so forth, not, not 181, not 194, not those related in, in to the right of return for Palestinian refugees. Millions of them are scattered in occupied Palestine, but also across the Middle East and across the world, not regarding the partition of Palestine, no, regarding the new status quo imposed by the US and by Israel on the Palestinians, and he did. And every single time they had him go back and repeat it in other languages. So they issued, the PLO issued statements in English, French, and eventually Arabic in order for them to prove their worth, that they can indeed be that partner that Israel wanted. At the end of the day, the Americans met with Yasser Arafat only with the promise that after that initial meeting, we are going to go through what they call a period of assessment just to assess. And after that assessment period, they are going to start advocating an international conference on the Middle East. Now, here's, here's the thing. The ploy has been taking place even before 1998, the Camp David talks, the uh, uh, Henry Kissinger shuttle diplomacy, all of these ploys and tricks have always been uh, there to create space for Israel to invest more in its colonialism, to ethnically cleanse more Palestinians, or as Ilan Papi referred to the, the uh, incremental genocide of the Palestinians, and to push Palestinians more and more outside any possible political paradigm that involves them. And that led all the way to the Abraham Accords. Original position, they played in the 40, late 40s, 50s, and 60s when they were largely irrelevant. They were not part of any real discussion. The discussion was largely uh, uh, promoted or championed by various Arab states and the Palestinians were always kind of in the, uh, in, in the, in the back line, just watching and, 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 and so forth. But at the end of the day, Palestinians are not only as a political power, the Palestinian Authority, the PLO, the Palestinian leadership, not only failed to secure any kind of, of a Palestinian state or even a Palestinian self-determination, they have been completely removed from the political equation. They receive money from the Americans and from the Europeans. They invest in their massive security apparatus with the understanding that they need to keep dissenting Palestinians at bay. And that is the status quo that the Americans are investing in and what the Israelis are investing in and so forth. So when we talk about a solution, we really shouldn't be talking about a two-state solution because it was always intended to be a ploy aimed at driving Palestinians to some sort of, sort of a political conversation, giving Palestinians the impression that 
the process is happening, trust the process, we are moving forward. But at the end of the day, if you look at the reality on the ground, you're gonna find settlements are growing, Palestinians are shrinking in number, Jerusalem being completely annexed, and Israel is preparing for a full annexation uh, of nearly 60% of the West Bank. So when we talk about one state solution, we have to talk about it within this context, as opposed to, and many of us are, are committing that mistake of, let's talk about one state because the two states have failed. But that's a mistake, because that means that we actually trusted that at one point there was any intention of building a state. If you look at the Israeli viewpoint from Sharon, Sharon's, uh, the Jordan option, remember Jerome, Sh Sharon's comments that uh, you know Jordan is Palestine and there is no such thing as Palestine. Netanyahu's championing of the so-called economic peace. Now, the Abraham Accord is actually Netanyahu's economic peace of 17 years ago. This is not a new thing. This is not a Jared Kushner invention. This is a Netanyahu's own invention. And when Netanyahu said, spoke about the economic peace, um, many of us thought that the guy is just saying nonsense and nobody could possibly pay any attention to this sort of political horizon. Sadly, it is now the defining political horizon as far as various Arab countries are concerned. But the Israelis have never truly committed to a two-state solution that not only that is viable, but even inviable in the sense that they really had no intention of seeing a Palestinian as such with a Palestinian flag, regardless of the status or the nature of that state. Which means that when we talk about one state, let's not talk about it in negation. As two states have failed, let's discuss the one state. The one state, the coexistence in this part of the world, in this country, should have been the rational option for 6.8 million Israeli Jews living in this piece of land between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea. You have 6.8 million Palestinians living in that exact same piece of land, and they are not divided as geographically as it may appear. There is so much overlapping, nearly 2 million Palestinians living in today's Israel. You have uh, um, something about 700,000, if not more, Jewish settlers living in East Jerusalem and in the West Bank. Even much of the water that goes to Israel is stolen, it's robbed outright from the Palestinians in the West Bank. So that one state reality already exists. But what doesn't exist is a political system that is fair and just, that doesn't recognize people or discriminate against people based on the color of their skin, based on their religion, based on their ethnicity, based on their background, based on their sex and so forth. That's what needs to be changed. We are already living that one state reality. We are just living it under a very misconstrued system, under a very strange, odd, racist, apartheid system. And so therefore, what we need to talk about, not only one state, but ending that apartheid system that would eventually make one state a reality on its own. I hope I did not exceed my time. No, you're very, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Barut for this um, wonderful presentation. I um, wanted to just remind the attendees that, um, we will have we will post these recordings on YouTube sometimes after the end of the conference, and we will send a notice to the um, registered participant. So um, we've been getting quite uh, people asking about that. So just wanted to let them know. And um, as I mentioned, any QA, uh, we're having uh, questions posted, so we'll hold off until the end um, to ask the questions. I'd like to uh, move on to our next panelist, uh, Professor Ayman Shahadi. Uh, uh, Professor Shahadi is a Palestinian American from Chicago who currently teaches courses on the Middle East and Palestine Israel at Columbia College and the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, he's an activist, a speaker on issues of human rights and academic freedom, 
and also works as a foreign policy advisor. He's currently a congressional candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives in Illinois' third district. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Jean, and uh, thank you, uh, Adib, and everybody who's organized this uh, event, as well as to our uh, panelists. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing today is looking at U.S. foreign policy uh, towards Israel uh, and why it has contributed to the, to the uh, demise of the so-called two-state solution, uh, which I think was never uh, the intent, uh, as I'll show you in my presentation. Uh, and also uh, the U.S. Uh, as well as Israel's uh, current attitude uh, towards the uh, one state idea or the one state concept. And so uh, if you look at the U.S. Uh, approach towards Israel, it's been a, a relatively stable ally since the inception of Israel uh, in 1948. Uh, although those reasons for supporting the country have shifted over time, uh, the support for Israel uh, in terms of uh, uh, logistic as well as material support has actually increased over time. Uh, and, you know, if, if we want to understand the similarities between the uh, or the reasons why the United States has been a historic uh, supporter of the state of Israel, we sort of have to look at the foundation of both uh, entities. And there are uh, actually striking similarities between Israel and the United States. First of all, both were founded through settler colonialism. Uh, and uh, both had a particular outlook towards the indigenous populations that they encountered. Uh, for the early American settlers, and even today you can see the, the, uh, 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 the resonance of that today, uh, the indigenous folks at worst were an existential problem uh, and at best a backward, uh, undeveloped uh, and racially inferior population. And Zionism, which is an ideology uh, that, of course, uh, drives Israel. Uh, it's an ideology whose followers advocate for the creation as well as the maintenance of a majority Jewish state uh, on a territory where the majority isn't Jewish uh, poses a dilemma for both the Zionists uh, and an existential threat for the Palestinians. So then uh, the Palestinians were and continue to be seen as an actual existential threat uh, because Zionism, in order for it to exist, in order for the state of Israel to exist, it needs to be a majority Jewish state. And so one can only imagine having to walk around the earth, walk around your country, uh, being seen by the uh, governing power as a threat to that governing power. And that's the way Palestinians have been seen uh, since the coming of Zionism in the late 19th century. And that's the way that they're seen today. They're seen as an existential threat to the state of Israel. Uh, and of course, like the uh, uh, early Europeans that came to America, there were Palestinians have also uh, are seen um, as uh, uh, it's propagated that they're backward and undeveloped and so forth. And this is something that emanates uh, from uh, Europe and these beliefs about indigenous non-European populations have their origins in what um, uh, UC scholar, uh, University of Chicago scholar Marshall Hodgson called the Great Western Transmutation, uh, which uh, he, he talks about a series of developments in Europe and technology as well as social power that propelled them to power unseen in human history. Uh, so as they began to conquer the world, they took that attitude of superiority with them and the successes of those conquests reinforced those attitudes of superiority. And we can see that the Zionists who, uh, uh, the early Zionists, the Europeans who founded the state of Israel took that attitude with them to Palestine. And in tandem with some of the developments that brought they brought to Palestine uh, and the support from like-minded Europeans who had that same attitude towards indigenous populations like the British, um, which was the, the Great Britain, which was a superpower at the time, uh, they, the Zionists began to dominate uh, just in the same way that Europeans dominated uh, the entire globe at one point, and in some ways uh, continue to do so today. People are trying to catch up to the developments of Europe um, in the last couple hundred years. So when Israel was created in 1948, it was not unnatural for the United States to be the first to recognize it. Um, and at that time, uh, the US saw Israel as a potential launching pad for US foreign policy. 
Of course, this was the era of the Cold War. So having a stable ally in the region could serve uh, U.S. interests. Uh, arming Israel became a U.S. foreign policy goal, uh, and uh, it increased over time. And the, the Palestinians were sort of the uh, sacrificial lamb of the process. And they were never really uh, discussed um, as far as uh, the, the their plight. Uh, they weren't discussed by the Arabs. So the, the expectation was that they, they're not going to be discussed by the West, uh, especially the United States. Today, Israel is the U.S.'s number one recipient of foreign aid uh, to the tune of about $4 billion a year. And this is besides the earmarks that Israel continuously gets. Uh, Israel is one of a few uh, bipartisan, bipartisan issues between uh, Democrats and Republicans and even independents. Uh, and uh, all parties overwhelmingly support Israel. Um, although sometimes there are a few dissenters, especially lately, in the so-called progressive wing of the Democratic Party, but even the, the progressive wing uh, of the Democratic Party tends to take a basket and pick and choose what it wants to be progressive on. And oftentimes they don't put the Palestinians in the basket, they leave them out despite supporting other progressive causes. And so one has to ask the question of why is that the case? Why does the United States overwhelmingly support uh, and gives uh, Israel a blank check uh, to uh, do what it wants to continue building settlements throughout the West Bank, despite the fact that the U.S. is on board with the so-called two-state solution, at least uh, in, in rhetoric it is, although we can see uh, that uh, there was never a real intent as far as a two-state solution. We, we go back to the Oslo Accords, there was a signing and a shaking of the hand, but the exchange was, and this was a, a terrible blunder by, by the Palestinian Authority, uh, was a shaking of the hands of recognizing the state of Israel and Israel recognizing uh, the PLO as a so-called sole representative of the Palestinian people. But if you take a close look at the Oslo Accords, there was never a real legitimate discussion about the core issues. No discussion about Jerusalem. There was no discussion about the refugee situation. There was no discussion about borders. There was no discussion about water. Uh, there was there was none of this. The ball was basically kicked down the field. And so, what happened as a result is the uh, this this new entity, the Palestinian Authority, began to be and continues to be a subcontractor to the occupation. So, what what Israel managed to do was was it managed to to use Palestinians to actually occupy Palestinians, uh, and it was one of the. Uh, um, uh, most uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, issues for, for Palestinians in general to realize because originally there was this honeymoon period, people were very excited and so forth, but later on people realized that the Oslo and the so-called two-state paradigm actually contributed more to the misery of Palestinians because now you had A, B, C, now you had uh, this, this apparatus that divided up uh, even the West Bank uh, to the tune of Palestinians not being able to move around. And of course, the, the wall came after that and this entire apparatus of segregation, uh, which we see today. So there is no doubt that uh, was there ever uh, asking the question, was, was there ever really a, an intent to create a two-state solution? And I think that you, know, you don't have to get as, as, as deep and as intellectual uh, in terms of uh, uh, ideas and so forth and having opinions about the Palestinian Authority, look at the settlements. You know, all you have to do is look at the settlements. When Oslo uh, began and the so-called peace process began, uh, there were approximately 140,000 settlers. Today, there are about um, 700. And so there has been an increase in settlements. There's an increase in the apparatus and it's choked the West Bank to the point where tangibly, at least, uh, in terms of what's on the ground, uh, where do you put the, the 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 second state? I was there in 2019, and I saw the the apparatus that's there. There's there's no place to put it. There's no place to put a two state, even if there was an intent uh, to create a two state solution, um, which uh, you know the, the evidence clearly shows that there was never an intent, but only a a creating an apparatus of uh, uh, normalizing the, the occupation. It's sort of very similar to the deal of the century that we saw a couple of years ago. It's, it's taking area A and B and saying, here's your state uh, and having and wanting the Palestinians to sign on the dotted line. It's basically 
uh, um, wanting the Palestinians to agree to this type of fate. And so um, it, it, there was never an intent as far as a two-state solution. And so we have to ask our question now, um, is, was there ever a point where uh, the state of Israel wanted a, a two-state solution? Uh, as I mentioned the settlers to you, um, the settlers are not on the fringes of Israeli society. They are officers in the military, members of the Knesset. The prime minister himself, Naftali Bennett, uh, was a, a the settler leader. And so it's not necessarily even about the, the uh, physical apparatus in the West Bank. It's about the ideological either. These guys are, are um, they're very militant and they're very determined and they're in the heart of the West Bank and they are at the center of Israeli power and Israeli politics. And for Israel to, to decide to one day leave uh, is not something that, uh, uh, there was never an intent to create settlements and then just get out of the settlements. And so this is something that uh, Israel calls facts on the ground uh, in order to actually prevent the establishment of a viable contiguous Palestinian state, which in of itself is, is uh, uh, for Palestinians, uh, accepting a Palestinian state in, in, in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, you're already uh, uh, giving up on approximately 80% of, the, of, the, of historic Palestine. And so th there's been a lot of compromise already, and unfortunately, uh, the results have not been there. And so why does the U.S. support Israel unconditionally in such a bipartisan way uh, here um, uh, in, in, in American politics. And so in order to answer that, we have to take a look at the political system in the US, uh, as well as uh, American voters whom I've become very familiar with in my uh, latest adventure here. Uh, in the United States, we have something called super PAC money, uh, and it has an enormous influence on the US political system. Uh, and uh, super PACs often dump tens of millions of dollars into a race to support a candidate uh, and in the case of uh, pro-Israel lobby groups, which are extremely powerful here in America, like APAC, Democratic Majority for Israel and others, uh, the idea is to, to support candidates, and they are very active, support candidates who are the most hawkish on Israel. Okay, So the majority of, of American candidates in the political system are supporters of Israel. Okay, It's just about how supportive are they of the hawkish element of Israel? Okay, so in the US, you have something called APAC, and then you have something called J Street. J Street is, a, is a, also a Zionist uh, lobby group, uh, but they're the organization that says, uh, Israel, uh, stop shooting, stop killing Palestinians, yet it loads the gun, it reloads the gun for Israel to keep shooting at Palestinians. That's the actual so-called progressive element of the Israeli, uh, the pro-Israel lobby group, which is which is J Street. AIPAC and, and Democratic Majority for Israel uh, are much more hawkish. They, they are uh, organizations that basically want to give a blank check to Israel and anything that uh, is deemed critical of that, uh, of Israel's actions is deemed as anti-Israel. Uh, and lumped into the idea of anti-Semitism. Um, and so you have that aspect, which, which really has a profound influence on candidates uh, and, and folks who are in positions that they will not criticize Israel. Uh, they, they will never criticize Israel because they're terrified, because they're going to get a lot of money lumped against them if they go against Israel. Uh, one of the reasons why for my candidacy is what I'm trying to do is, is, is trying to sort of change that. It's not just about the seat. It's about saying, look, you can run a pro-Palestine candidate uh, who doesn't accept these kinds of endorsements, and you can still show well, and you can still, you can still win. That's the idea behind my candidacy. Um, and so it, sort of trying to, to, to change the status quo that currently uh, exists when it comes to the way that uh, candidates look at Israel. So this idea is the idea is to empower them and to say, hey, you can be supportive of Palestinian rights and you can still win. And I do see uh, that aspect in existence here in the United States. We're getting to that point uh, now. And an example of that would be what happened in Gaza uh, last year. There was a, a, a very surprising response here in America, pro-Palestine, a very empathetic response to the egregious human rights violations that Israel uh, committed against Palestinians during that latest onslaught. Uh, 
uh, and we also have uh, the evangelical vote here in the United States, which is coveted by the right. Uh, there's a, a large segment of the population in, in the United States uh, who are Christian Zionists, uh, who believe that Israel must exist in order for uh, the, the Christ to, to return. This is an actual idea that exists and millions of people follow it. And so Israel having to exist in order for Jesus to return, once Jesus returns, well, what happens to, to, to Jews and, and, and other non-Christians and, and, and Palestine and the Middle East, that's a whole other topic, but it's not good. Okay, only a few are supposed to survive the rapture and so forth. And people are buying into this idea. And so they give Israel a, bl a blank check. And so Republicans, as was the case with Donald Trump, will do anything to get their vote, uh, as was the case with Trump, uh, who recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights and Jerusalem and, and so forth. He did all those things primarily to get uh, um, Sheldon Edelson's money, who gave him about $150 million, but also to get the evangelical vote on his side as well. Uh, all of this has made the two-state solution, which, which in, in, in its original form, uh, was never a, a, uh, a motivation for the state of Israel to begin with, but all of this coupled together has made the issue impossible. And so what are the other options? What are we left with now? Um, and, you know, people say, you know, let's, you know, we, we should advocate for a single state. Well, guess what? It's already a single state. It is, a, we live, the, Palest the, the Palestinians and the Israelis live in a single state. Israel controls that entire area and has controlled that entire area since 1967. Uh, and it's a question of how do people live in that state? How do Palestinians live in that state? Well, it depends on where Palestinians live in the state. If they live in the West Bank, they get the worst of the apartheid. Uh, if they live in Israel, they get apartheid too, as Human Rights Watch and Beit Salem and, and Amnesty International have said. But the levels of apartheid are different. But but the, the 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 theme is the same, in which they do live under a system of apartheid. And of course, that includes Gaza. Gaza is also occupied. Uh, its air and space is occupied. Its 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 water is occupied. Uh, its borders are occupied. So Gaza is also occupied, despite the fact that Israel says it's withdrawn its uh, so-called troops uh, from Gaza. Um, but Israel, and this is this is the the other aspect of this, and this is so Orwellian, is that those who advocate here in the United States, like myself, those who advocate for a single state solution, for a rights based solution based on equality, dignity, freedom, just, justice for everybody in that land is considered an anti-Semite or a person who is an eliminationist, a person who wants to eliminate the state of Israel. Because again, going back to what we said earlier, in order for Israel to uh, seize itself uh, as, a, as a state where the majority of its population isn't Jewish. And so, so if you give rights to all the Palestinians, then Israel is no longer technically a Jewish state, which undermines Zionism. Uh, my response to that is, is, is if, if we're talking about giving uh, freedom, dignity, equality, justice to everybody, and if that undermines the existence of a state, well, then there's something wrong with a state, right? There's something wrong with a state that says everybody can't have freedom, dignity, and equality uh, if that state is going to be undermined. And so, uh, obviously, Israel needs to change its, uh, its course when it comes to that particular issue. Um, and so on that note, uh, it, it, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I've been teaching at, at uh, Columbia and the Art Institute and other places and advocating for this idea and concept of a, of a single state. And I get called an anti-Semite as a result of that. Uh, this, is, this is where we're at uh, at this point by, by the US uh, uh, academic system as well as the US political system at this point where if you're advocating for equality, you're considered uh, someone who is uh, a radical and an anti-Semite. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shadi, for this comprehensive um, overview. Um, we have quite a few questions, so again, we'll wait till the end um, to um, um, present them. So let me move on to uh, Mr. Gideon Levy. Um, no introduction, but I will uh, quickly uh, say Mr. Uh, Gideon Levy is an Israel, Israeli journalist and author. He writes uh, opinion pieces and weekly columns for the newspaper Hearts, and that often focuses on the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories. 
He is the author of Twilight Zone, Life and Death Under the Israeli Occupation, 1988 to 2003, and The Punishment of Gaza. Uh, Mr. Levy has won uh, multiple prizes of his article on human rights in the Israeli occupied territories. And in 2000, uh, 2021, he won an Israel's top award for journalism, the Sokolov Award. Thank you very much for joining us um, today. Um, please go ahead. Um, you're on mute. Thank you, Rim, and thank you for having me. And thank you for having this opportunity because I think there is nothing more important now rather than to advocate for the one state solution everywhere within Palestine, within Israel, in the United States, in Europe. It's a long way to go, but it's very, very important that we start it because for people like me, that's the only source of hope. And it is still a very limited hope, a very risky hope, and with very little chances, I'm afraid to say. The two-state solution is the best solution. It is about two peoples sharing one piece of land. Let's share the land uh, for the two peoples. For many years, I truly believe that that's, that's the most uh, just solution. The only problem is that this solution is dead. Not only it is dead, as the two former speakers rightly say, Dr. Schade and Dr. Baroud, the two-state solution was never born. And that's the truth and we have to realize it. But it's not relevant anymore. Yes, Israel never had in mind to enable a real Palestinian state a viable Palestinian state like any other state in the international community. This was never in the minds of any of Israeli prime ministers, including uh, Peace Nobel Prize uh, winners. None of them really meant it. But now, in any case, it's not relevant anymore. This train left the station and it will never be back. The two-state solution died. In the day that, in the Oslo records, Israel and Palestine ignored the core question, the core problem, namely the problem of the settlements. Once Oslo ignored it, as if it doesn't exist, the population in the settlements, as the two gentlemen before me rightly said, more than tripled. And we are really in an, in an in irreversible reality. I invite all of you to travel throughout the West Bank. It's enough one hour drive to realize that anyone who speaks about the two state solution is cheating himself and cheating anyone else. It's not possible. Nobody in Israel will ever have the power and the will to evacuate 700,000 Jewish settlers. Without their evacuation, there is no viable Palestinian state. You know, even if the, in the good times, when there was still hope for the two-state solution, this unbelievable condition that Israel had put, that this state should be demilitarized, showed everything on the surface. Why should, why would the Palestinian state be demilitarized? Is Israel demilitarized? Why don't the Palestinians have the right to protect themselves? And this was accepted all over the world. The West, the United States, the EU, everyone accepted it. There's something natural. Sure, the Palestinians don't have the right to protect themselves. It goes without saying. Because year after year, we are talking about security. And when we are talking about security, we are talking only about security for the Israelis, never about security to the Palestinians. What about their security? What about their right to protect themselves? What about the endless innocent victims throughout the years, 10 and 100 times more than the Israeli victims? 
in numbers. What about them? They didn't have the right to protect themselves. But as I said, this is yesterday's song. The two-state solution is dead. But the two-state solution is not dead in the international diplomacy. It is the best tool to continue to support the Israeli occupation. It's the best tool to continue not to do anything for the international community. It's the best tool to strengthen the apartheid system. Because what do the international community say, including the PA, by the way, including the PA, including Benjamin Netanyahu and the EU and the United States? There is a solution on the shelf. It's called the two-state solution. Don't worry, one day we'll take it. It's not now because as you know, it's not the proper time. One day it will be the proper time for this. Meanwhile, we'll triple the number of, of settlements. We'll expel as many Palestinians as we can. We'll, we'll uproot as many olive trees as we can. And one day this will become the solution. By this, this is convenient to everybody. The international community who is in any case sick and tired from this whole dispute, this whole conflict, the international community has other issues now to deal with, Ukraine and environment and immigration. For them, it's wonderful, it's ideal. We all support the two-state solution and we filled our duty. We paid our lip service to justice, for justice. For the PA, the same, because if it's about realizing the two-state solution is dead, then what did the PA contribute to its people? What were their achievements? Where do they go from here? What do we need the PA at all? It's a big question. And for Israelis, at least part of them who have some kind of guilt feelings and some kind of conscience, this is a wonderful uh, um, solution for them. We are in favor of two-state solution. Once you say it, you become a liberal Israeli who is conscious, who just waits for the Palestinian partner to appear, for the right moment to appear, for the right opportunity to appear. But we all support the two-state solution. So we are liberal, uh, conscious, Israelis. But this is a masquerade. All this is a masquerade. It's convenient for everybody and it has only one hidden purpose, namely to maintain the occupation, to deepen and strengthen it until something will happen. Now for many years, I must say, I thought that the occupation cannot last forever. Because history told us that most of the people who struggled for their freedom and rights finally got it. Because occupation by itself is so rotten that it will fall by itself. But I must tell you in recent years, I'm not so sure that the occupation will fall by itself. We are in one of the worst moments in the history of the Israeli occupation. The Palestinians are as divided, weak, lonely, bleeding, lacking leadership and lacking spirit of struggle like never before. The Arab world couldn't care less, never did care too much about the Palestinians. The Western world is losing interest. Israel is by far too strong. The Palestinians are by far too divided and too weak. And I must tell you that in the last months, I have the fear that this can continue forever. Look at the Native Americans, what happened to them? The Palestinians might find themselves with the same um, reality, becoming forgotten. Look at the Tibetan people in China. You can lose it, we can lose it. On the other hand, we know that there is an alternative path. There is an alternative way. There is a source of hope. 
The only problem is that too many people are still sticking to the two-state solution as if this is the solution, the only solution. And by this, they are enabling Israel to continue with all the brutality, the totalitarian regime, the tyranny in the West Bank and Gaza, and also inside Israel. And it is, on one hand, a very revolutionary solution. On the other hand, it's not such a revolutionary solution as it seems. Because as Dr. Baroud and Dr. Shradi said before me, the one state is existing now for 52, 53 years. It's not something we have to create, it's there. It's only about its regime. That's the only problem, its regime. There is no green line. There is no two states. There is one state. Gaza, Nablus, Jenin, eh, eh, Bethlehem, Jericho, Hebron are ruled by Israel. Anyone there is under the Israeli rule, day and night when he wakes up and when he goes to sleep and even after it. So it is one state. The same government that rules me, rules my friend in Jenin refugee camp. It's the same government, the same army, the same police. So it is a one state. The only problem is its regime. Now this calls for a reset and restart of everything. The Israelis will find it very hard. Maybe also part of the Palestinians will find it very hard. But I'm talking from the Israeli point of view. The one state solution obviously means the end of Zionism. Zionism today means only one thing, Jewish superiority, Jewish supremacy. And Jewish supremacy means apartheid. It goes without saying, I don't think that here I have to explain why Jewish supremacy means apartheid. There's no other definition for apartheid. If it looks like apartheid, it behaves like apartheid, it is apartheid. This must come to its end. For many, many Israelis, including, you know, my parents who came here as refugees from World War II, this will be a very hard, um, very painful step to give up the Jewish state, to give up the dream about having a Jewish state, and to, to put place, put space for something else which is not a Jewish state. But is there any other choice? Those in Israel who wanted the Jewish state, which I'm not one of, because until this very moment, I have no idea what does it mean a Jewish state. And nobody in Israel knows what does it mean a Jewish state. Is the United States an American state or is it a democracy? Is Germany a German state or, or is it a democracy? Is Sweden a Swedish state or it is a democracy? I know only two, three countries which are defined according to a certain people or religion. This is the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, maybe Afghanistan and Israel, no other place, define itself according to the identity, the religious or nationalistic identity of its citizens. Every state is the state of all its citizens. But in Israel, if you say Israel should be the state of all its citizens, you are a traitor. You betray the idea. And Israel, like Soviet Russia, is a one ideological state. I mean, there's no room for another ideology, or maybe we'll call it a religion, namely Zionism. You can't be not Zionist or anti-Zionist in Israel. But Zionism finally is only an ideology. And this ideology was very vital to create the state of Israel. And I think there was room for creating a state for the Jewish people after the Holocaust. But this was a long time ago, and Israel missed the opportunity to have a Jewish state. Those who care about Jewish state should have never supported the occupation. You want a Jewish state, you need the Jewish majority. That's the minimum. 
you don't have a Jewish majority. We are 50-50, two peoples, really 50-50 right now. So it calls for the Israelis to separate from the idea of a Jewish state, from the idea of having Zionism as the dominating ideology, and to really change everything. On one hand, it's a very, very painful process for most of my fellow Israelis, not for me, by the way. For me, nothing is easier than this. People ask, so what do you mean? That the Minister of Defense will be Palestinian? I told him I want the Minister of Defense to be a conscious, gifted man. Who cares if he's Palestinian or Jewish? I know some members of the Israeli parliament who are Palestinians who are 10 times more devoted, more talented, and more clever than most of the Jewish uh, members of parliament members of Knesset, so what? But you know, after so many years of brainwash, of systematic brainwash, it's a long way to go because Israelis had never come to terms, and maybe this is the core issue, they never come to terms with the belief that the Palestinians are equal human beings like us. And as long as this will not change, nothing will change because it's really all about equality. Once the majority of Israelis will accept the Palestinians as equal human beings, and we are very far off because most of them don't. Don't be wrong, don't be mistaken. Most of the Israelis don't see the Palestinians as equal human beings. But once this will change, the way we look much easier than we think because finally we are living together. There are some precedents, some examples of really fair life together. Go, for example, to the health uh, establishment in Israel, to the health services, and you will see really quite encouraging phenomena of head of departments, doctors, nurses, everything who are all of them Palestinians, and we are dealing there with life and death. It's about health and it's working and it's working very well. There are some other examples, but we should now, and this by this I will conclude, we should now really do all our efforts not only to go for the one-state solution, but to try to release the world from this false belief that the two-state solution is still possible. Because all those who believe in the two-state solution are misleading themselves, cheating themselves, and cheating the world, and time is running out. What we should do, I really think, and it's not so hard, we should try to start to change the international discourse, to speak about equal rights, to speak about one person, one vote. It is very simple to understand. It is very hard to deny. What will Israel say if the international community will come one day and say, okay, the settlements stay there, everything stays there. No question of borders, just equal rights. And I want to see Israel re reacting to this. If Israel says no, which it will say, then Israel by itself declares itself as an apartheid state. And then it's about the international community to treat the second apartheid state in the same tools like it did treat the first apartheid system in South Africa until it fall because of the involvement of the international community. Because don't expect the Israelis to wake up one morning and to say, oh, this occupation is not very nice, let's put an end to it. It will never happen. It will only happen if the international community will say its very clear word and will stop talking and move into actions. Because that's the only language in international relations. Look at Russia and Ukraine few weeks of occupation brought so many sanctions. Why 54, 55 years of occupation don't even bring the, the right to speak about sanctions? 
You know, if you speak about sanctions over Israel, as some of us say, you are an anti-Semite. We shouldn't surrender to it. We should raise our voice, speak only about a very simple, basic right. And this is one person, one vote. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, um, Mr. Levy, for this presentation. <clears throat> and from someone that is living the situation, on, um, it, so we're going to go into some of the questions so we don't um, run out of time. We have a few questions here. Um, I have here one for Dr. Rothschild. And the question is the issue of demographic change. If Jews become a minority in a one-state solution. So what is the question? I mean, what will happen? Yes. <laughs> well, you know, if Jews become a minority in the one-state solution, then that's the reality of the one-state solution. And the problem is that I think uh, particularly Israeli Jews feel like, well, that threatens them because they're afraid they're gonna be treated the way they treated their Palestinian population that they've dominated. But in a democracy, that's how it works. And I think that there will always be a major Jewish presence in whatever turns out in this area. There's uh, you know, Hebrew language, there's the academy, there's a culture, there's, it, it, there will be a Jewish component to the state. But there also must be a recognition that there is a Palestinian component to the state, and you know that uh, my experience is that the, that the cultures are not that different in a lot of ways, and there's a lot of commonality. And so I think the the fear factor is very big, um, but that taking the steps towards one person, one vote, the recognition that a country is made up of its citizens. You know, you take it step by step and you figure it out. I, I don't think it's by definition, you know, the end of Jews. I think it's a, by definition, right now, Israelis live in a much more endangered state, Israeli Jews, uh, because of the policies of the Israeli government. Great. Thank you so much for um, this answer. And uh, um, Mr. Levy, had, you mentioned uh, some of the problems is that. Uh, the Palestinians are divided, and the question is, attendees asking, why are the Palestinians so divided? Part of it, obviously, is because of the Israeli strategy. Israel did anything possible to divide the Palestinians. This uh, unbelievable division between, first of all, between Gaza and the West Bank, which is really very cruel, between Jerusalem, East Jerusalem and the West Bank, between the Israeli Palestinians, what we call the Israeli Arabs, the 48 Arabs and the West Bankers, between the diaspora and those who stayed, between the refugees in the refugee camps and all the rest, Israel has a responsibility in it. But I don't want to say that it's only about Israel and Palestinians have no responsibility about it. One of the big advantages of Nelson Mandela and the, and the Congress, the African Congress was that they were united. They struggled together. When Mandela started the, the negotiations, with the whites from jail. He called to bring the most radical ones to the negotiation table because Mandela was great enough to understand this un that unity in those times, not always, I'm not in favor of unity because unity can also sound very fascist, but unity when you are struggle on one cause is essential. And the Palestinians, were united as long as Yasser Arafat was around, at least relatively. And ever since he is gone, and they are lacking also leadership, as I said, unity is gone. And I think this is one of the biggest achievements of Israeli strategies. But in the same time, it is also Palestinian responsibility. Thank you. 
they should have put everything aside and concentrate only in one thing, fighting and resisting the occupation. And then after they succeed with this, then they can divide and argue about will it be a secular state or a religious state, Hamas or Fatah or whoever. But they should overcome the, the, the difficulties that Israel put them, the challenges that Israel put them in really doing anything possible to divide them. But they should have been stronger than this. Thank you. Um, actually, continuation to this, uh, another pan um, attendee had asked um, on the delayed of the Palestinian elections. Um, um, what's your comment on that, Mr. Bibi? Like the they're asking on the delayed for the Palestinian elections, if the panel oh, I, I, if they can comment on the delay for the, of, on the Palestinian elections. I think a Palestinian should answer this question. I mean, okay. it's not for me to answer it. Okay. Um, then I'll leave it to either Professor Shada or Dr. Baruch to um, comment on why the um, Palestinian election is delayed. Well, the, I mean, first of all, what 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 election and what is representation are we talking about here? I think that's super important. I mean, you know, this is uh, the the whatever power that the Palestinian Authority has is derivative of the state of Israel. There's no doubt about that. So, and and as a premise, the the idea that the Palestinians are holding elections and they have a president and they also have a prime minister. They have two. In the United States, we have one. We only have a president. We don't even have a prime minister. So I think that in of itself, as a premise, it's very problematic because it gives the illusion that somehow the Palestinians are sovereign, which, are, which they're not. And somehow there's a Palestinian state, which, which doesn't exist. Um, another point is that, you know, the, the, the reality is, as far as uh, the Palestinian Authority is concerned, is that, you know, there's a lot of corruption in the Palestinian Authority. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I and mean, we, you know, the this is something that needs to be acknowledged and known that the Palestinian Authority has not served in whatever capacity it could have had to serve the Palestinian people. It just has not done. It is, 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 a, is a failed entity. Um, and it, and it's at its very core and at its very root, it was not meant to serve the Palestinian people. It was meant to be a subcontractor to the, to the occupation. And that's the bottom line. So inherently, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an entity that, that shouldn't even have existed in the first place. As far as elections and so forth, and we hear all this. This is these questions. They they uh, they assume a lot of things. Uh, they assume sovereignty. They assume that because the Palestinians are not holding elections, the Palestinians, you know, somehow the the system is is uh, you know they're they're not being democratic or so forth. The whole system is draconian. It's undemocratic. It shouldn't exist in the first place. So my response to that is it's 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 not relevant. They're all uh, it's uh, the the system from from A to Z. Uh, is uh, is at its very core festering. Uh, and if uh, Dr. Barud would want to elaborate on that, please go ahead. I thank you, um, Ayman. Yes, of, of course. In fact, I mean, the whole question of elections, it, it kind of buys into this illusion that uh, there is a state and there is a degree of sovereignty and the onus is on the Palestinians to unify their ranks and to, as per the demands of Israeli former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and others, you know, we need a peace partner. We don't have a peace partner, and a peace partner can only be an outcome of a democratic process. Uh, and since the Palestinians are undemocratic, unlike us, the only democracy in the Middle East, uh, we can't possibly have that trusted uh, uh, democratic partner. Now, the problem with this is that Israel has done everything it's in, its, in its power to ensure the demise of any elements of Palestinian democracy, even at a civil society level, even at university levels. Like I, I was a student at Birzeit University uh, in 1994, and, um, or rather, yeah, 1994, and we were holding a, a, an elections that really the main topic of the discussion was Gaza, Jericho, and the Oslo peace process and all of that. And because the Israelis did not want the faction that, uh, that uh, did not support the Oslo peace process, 
Uh, they raided the university, arrested most of the leadership, including myself, deported some of us in Gaza, put some, many of us in prison to ensure that the numbers add up in the right direction. At the end of the day, we still won the elections. But Israel does everything in its power to thwart Palestinian democracy, the same way they try to thwart Palestinian unity. But um, and, and not just the Israelis, it's very important to mention that the Americans too. I mean, we remember the various uh, Hamas, Fatah, uh, unity agreements that have been signed throughout the years in which the Americans come and put their foot down. Condoleezza Rice made it very clear when she was Secretary of State to Mahmoud Abbas, she said, any agreement with the terrorist group Hamas means the end of American funding of, of the Palestinian Authority. And, and immediately Mahmoud Abbas wouldn't dare he pulled out. It happened repeatedly. So, so this is a very, very strange situation. Someone opens the door, says, come in. The moment you try to come in, they slam the door on your face over and over and over again. And at the end of the day, all of this is forgotten. It's only remembered that the Palestinians are by nature undemocratic. And like the Iraqis and other Arab nations, you can't expect them to be, you know, another model of Scandinavian democracy. So let's give up on this whole illusion of making the Arab democratic, which is a racist notion, of course, on its own. But just one very quick thing, if you don't mind, just the question uh, that was asked earlier to Alice, and I'm sorry to kind of butt in there and to claim a question that's not mine, but very quickly, you know, this whole idea, and I've been asked this question numerous times in the past, what if Israeli Jews agreed to live with the Palestinians, but then the Palestinians, you know, stabbed them in the back, or, or once the Jews are a minority, they find themselves being victims to programs of some kind and, and so forth, which is a very, very strange notion I have never seen in any national liberation struggle throughout my readings of history in which the onus has ever been in the colonized nation to provide security assurances to the colonized. It just doesn't work. And sadly, it is a question that we engage with. And we try to assure, like, for example, here's one of the suggested answers that we Palestinians often give. Jews and Muslims have lived together for 500 years in the Iberian Peninsula, today is Spain, and we got along just fine and, and all of this. As if we are trying to kind of show our merit that we are civilized and we are capable. Well, guess what? Prior to the establishment of Zionism and the destruction of the Palestinian homeland, including that of my own village, Beit Daras in Southern Palestine, and the butchering of many people of my village, including that of 500 villages across Palestine. Prior to that, Palestinian Jews coexisted with Palestinian Arabs, Muslims, and Christians. They were Palestinian Jews and they spoke in our accent and they were part of the very fabric of our society. It was the start of Zionism that ended all of this. So the onus should be on the Palestinians who coexisted with Jews as members of their own society for hundreds of years or the European colonizers that come and came and disrupted that peace and that harmony. That question shouldn't be asked to us. It should be asked to the Zionists how can Palestinians guarantee by agreeing to coexist with you that you will not resort to your violent means as you have done in the last 100 years? Thank you, Dr. Barut, for this, um, and, Dr. and Professor Shadi for the answer. Um, the next question I have is a little long, so bear with me. It's, um, do you believe that the emergence of a singular state that provides liberty and justice for all its inhabitants can truly arise without a civil war-like situation for both the Palestinians and the Israelis? Considering that both governments have a lot to lose with such a just state, will the current regime truly go quietly into the night without a fight? If so, how? And I open it to anyone that is, um, like to answer the question uh, from the panelists. I can try. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Look, we, we, the, the, this question repeats itself again and again, mainly in Israel, 
you, it will be a terrible blood bath, it will be a terrible bloodshed. Same things were, be, were said, by the way, in South Africa. I remember when people in South Africa say this will be a bad blast and all the white people will be slaughtered and it has no chance. And it didn't happen, by the way, in South Africa with all the problems. Uh, you cannot judge the future according to the present reality. Sure, if the same institutions, relationship, values, which and beliefs which are today will continue to, to prevail, will continue to be the, the, the reality, then it must lead to a to terrible budget. It will not go without it. But the, the, idea, the idea is to reset, to restart a new reality, which will not go along the lines of today's reality. If the fear and the hatred, and there is a lot of fear and a lot of hatred in both peoples, if the fear and the hatred, a part of it is very justified, by the way, from both sides. If the fear and the hatred will continue like it is now, so yes, the question is a very legitimate question. And the answer is, it will lead to, to a terrible bloodshed, yes. But the idea is to create a reality in which there will be new rules of the game. And I don't think it is impossible. I don't think it is unthinkable, especially when I think what is the alternative? Because whoever who has all those skeptical and so many skepticism about the one state solution, one should always ask what is the alternative? And the alternative is always more horrifying than this. I think on that note too, just uh, just let me add, I think it's just a, a, a matter of just looking at reality. Would you rather be living amongst a population that's angry and oppressed, uh, which would um, translate oftentimes into hostility, or would you rather be living with a population that has freedom, dignity, justice, and opportunity? Uh, the, the idea that giving another group of human beings equality and justice uh, and allowing their kids to be able to go to school without the threat of being shot at, of allowing their children to, to have an opportunity for a future, rather than what we see today in the refugee camps of Gaza and, and in the slums of uh, 48 or in the, uh, the situation in the West Bank, uh, and, and, and change that into an opportunity for prosperity. Uh, you as a as a former oppressor would be uh, actually safer in in transitioning to that in transitioning to, to giving human beings an opportunity uh, to have those freedoms and so forth. But living with a with a population that is growing that is more than half, by the way, at this point, because if you count the Palestinians in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, who are often in East Jerusalem, are often discounted, by the way. If you count them in East Jerusalem, if you count them in the West Bank, if you count them in 48, and if you count them in Gaza, the, the Palestinians already outnumber the, the, uh, the uh, Israelis. And so it's just a matter of um, you want a population that's constantly oppressed and, and, and therefore hostile, or do you want a population that, uh, that has opportunities and therefore uh, can create a, a bridge uh, to, to first healing uh, and then to, to actually being able to live together uh, as human beings and, and respecting each other as human beings. And I would like to add that if you look at the level of violence that the Israeli military does to Palestinians and the ongoing settler attacks, which have dramatically increased over the last few years and the wanton killing of uh, people um, who are Palestinian, the Palestinians are already living in a chronic ongoing bloodbath. And that is unacceptable. And so I think we have to be real about the issue of bloodbath. It is happening. It's just not happening to nice Jews living in Tel Aviv, but it's happening to Palestinians every day. Thank you. And on that note, Sorry. yeah, go ahead. Do you, do you mind if I oh, just interject very quickly? Of course. Very quickly, um, very quickly there's um, 
last March there was a, uh, the the list of the happiest people on earth or the happiest nations on earth came out and uh, and the Israelis uh, believe it or not were number nine and I thought that was quite uh, you know ironic that if you follow mainstream media coverage you would think that the Israelis are the most miserable in the world because of their ingrained sense of insecurity, that uh, Islamic terrorists uh, surrounding them from everywhere, the, the existential threat that they keep talking about. It just comes to show you the, 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 you know, the, the difference here between illusions and reality. Uh, and, and back to what Alice has said, rightly so, that it's really only the, it's it's a matter of perspective. I was born and raised in a refugee camp in Gaza, uh, and even though I left uh, the refugee camp many years ago, and even though during my time in the refugee camp, the situation was quite you know comparatively far better than the ongoing genocide in Gaza and the starvation happening in Gaza and the fact that Gaza is unlivable uh, per the very standards of the United Nations and water is polluted at 98% levels. Um, I don't remember a day in which we had a, even an illusion of safety or security. Now the situation is far worse. So Palestinians stand to lose nothing by continuing their resistance. This idea of why are the Palestinians doing this? Why do we keep they keep lopping these homemade rockets to Israel? They're not really killing anybody, but they are instigating an Israeli um, attacks and so forth and so on. So what, however you spin it, somehow we are responsible. We are responsible for everything. Uh, and yet the Israelis are happily reporting that they are the ninth happiest nation on earth. So we really have to start thinking about things from a bit more balanced perspective on this issue. And remember that it is the Palestinians, not the Israelis who are the true victims of this. They are the occupied, the oppressed, the colonized, and the victims of apartheid, not the Israelis. And therefore, we shouldn't be thinking about solutions per se, but how do we ho hold the state of Israel accountable? How do we raise the price high enough that the Israelis, nation and governments, nations and governments, uh, uh, understand that they have to reach some kind of uh, an arrangement with the Palestinians that gives them a minimal amount of basic human rights, dignity, respect, political rights, and so forth. And only then we can actually start talking about a possible solution that is a prolonged arrangement that suits everybody. Until this equilibrium or this paradigm continues to be shifted in favor of the Israelis, this is going to continue. I just want to add one more quick thing here. I, I think it, which is, uh, I think that if you look at the, for all of the oppression and the, the egregious rights violations that you see happening to the Palestinians and in and, and 48 uh, in the West Bank, in Gaza, in East Jerusalem, uh, the level of response and violence as far as the Palestinians is actually, uh, they tolerate a lot. The Palestinians have tolerated so much so much since since the advent of Zionism in that in, in, in that area, and they continue to tolerate so much, you would think that there would be more violence. You would think that there would be more of a response. And people say, well, there's going to be a, a violent backlash if Palestinians uh, actually get their rights. They're, 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 they're not being violent when they don't have rights. You think they're going to be violent when they when they do have their rights? I mean, this is uh, the, the, this idea of Palestinians uh, are, are going to somehow kill uh, uh, non-Palestinians in the country because they receive their rights is has got a lot of racist aspects to it and a lot of sort of racist ramifications. And that these people, this this the, the Palestinian objective is to is to they they cannot uh, 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 live as as civil human beings or civilized human beings and so forth. But the evidence is right there for you to see is that they don't have rights and they still they, they, they tolerate so much. One can only imagine if they did have rights. Listen, the bottom line is people want to be able to take their kids to school. They want their children to be safe. They want to be safe. They, have, they want to have normalcy in the short time people have on this planet. That's what people want. And that's what the Palestinians are, are, are searching for at this point. And that's what they're striving for. And so this idea, this, this fear mongering that, that somehow 
uh, the the Palestinians are going to attack uh, Jews or Israelis. It's uh, is uh, there's a there's a huge fallacy there that I think we should take note of. Thank you, Professor Shadi, for this um, very good point. Um, so, Mr. Levy kept saying that you know we have to hit the reset button. So we have a attendee here is saying is asking. Sorry, I lost my little question here. Give me a second. Uh, to support the one state solution from the grassroots. So how close or far are both the Israeli and Palestinians populations at the grassroots to supporting a one state solution? If they are not close, how can this be a viable solution? Yes, uh, I think uh, in the level of grassroots, there's a big difference in the basic sentiment, and we are generalizing now, because there's no other way to deal with it rather than generalize. I think the as I, as I as my impression is, the majority of the Palestinians, not all of them, obviously not all of them, but the majority of the Palestinians. Their, their sentiment is living together in, in equality, obviously, in justice, in, in, with respect, but living together. The national sentiment in Israel is opposite, is separation. Even the so-called leftists, the Zionist leftists, they speak about they are there and we are here, separation. This should be overbridged. And therefore, by the way, already today you see in polls, there is much more support for the one state solution among the Palestinians rather than among the Israelis. On the other hand, I must say that the one state solution was almost illegitimate to mention a few years ago in Israel. And now, you can at least mention it. It's, I don't want to have any illusions, to spread any illusions. It's a very long way to go, especially in Israel, mainly in Israel. Israel has also much more to lose. The Palestinians, for them, any solution will be better than the current situation. But for the Israelis, it is still a very threatening idea they will immediately speak about mistrust and, and bloodbaths, as I said before, and massacres and, and unheard of. But I think that five years ago, they wouldn't listen to it at all, and now they start to listen. Now, I'm a great believer, as I said before, in international intervention. I don't think we can wait until the Israelis will come into terms with, the, with this idea because it will never happen. Why would they? There's no, inside, no, no reason for the Israelis to go for any kind of solution because life in Israel is wonderful. Why would they bother about what's going on one hour away from their homes? The media is totally denying it and not covering it. Israelis, most of them live in a terrible denial about what's going on. They know nothing and they don't want to know nothing and they're not bothered. So here and there, there is some terror because the Palestinians were born to kill, but it's not enough to really bother their good life. It will not come from here. It must come from the outside. It must come from the international community like it came in South Africa. But first we have to make our efforts to convince the international community that that's the only solution left. I also think that the idea of that Israelis have of we're here and they're there is a fantasy. 20 plus percent of Israeli citizens are Palestinian. Uh, there are you know, 700,000 plus settlers, Jewish settlers living amongst Palestinians. T tens of thousands of Palestinian workers come into Israel every day. It's not a here and there situation. That's, that is a real, fantasy, I think, on the part of uh, Jewish Israelis. Thank you uh, to both of you. I want to kind of shift things a little bit to talk about in the US, there's a question on what can um, people do here. So the question is, what does the Palestine 
solidarity movement in the US mainly and in other countries as well, not recognize that sticking to an agonistic or neutral position on a one state, two state is holding us back. What can be done to break out of that deadlock? If I may uh, say something on this quickly, Reem. Sure. Um, I think there has been a lot of hesitance, not just within the Palestine solidarity uh, communities uh, in the US, but throughout the world. I think Oslo created a great deal of confusion amongst a lot of people, because on the one hand, uh, it, uh, many, many of these uh, organizations and civil society groups still find themselves beholden to the whole concept of the two states because it is the one that is internationally recognizable. And therefore, if you advocate a, a, a solution that's not even on the table from a political and a diplomatic point of view, what are you advocating? The other thing, you have the Palestinian Authority, which is one of the biggest obstacles in the face of Palestinian liberation. They are still feeding that illusion that a two-state solution is still possible. They still write articles in mainstream American and Western newspapers saying that this is the last chance. You know, the, the time is about to run out for the two states and they have been breathing life in, in it day after day, year after year. And a lot of organizations find it quite difficult to challenge that viewpoint, especially when you do not have an organized political initiative coming from the Palestinians and it truly claims some kind of representation among the Palestinian people that actually champions a one state strategy. And this is what we are working on. This is the true responsibility of the Palestinian people. Two things, carry on with our resistance, unhindered by anything. And number two, eventually uh, articulate a political discourse that emanates from the Palestinian people themselves. And we know uh, in the last few months, there were new polls coming out in Palestine in which that critical mass has already been achieved in the West Bank. Majority of Palestinians in the West Bank believe in a one state solution, not quite the majority on, in Gaza. So I think we are certainly going towards that point. Now that said, doesn't mean that during this transition, the international community or rather solidarity groups in the US and in the West everywhere in the world just stand and just fold their arms and just you know, kind of look for the Palestinians to give them that political vision? I think not. I think our responsibility, whether we are Americans or British or French or, or South Africans or Brazilians, is that we need to hold our governments accountable to international law. We need to ensure that the BDS movement continues to achieve and garner its deserved success. And we need to ensure that Palestinians are at the heart of the conversation pertaining to Palestine. That's how it works, uh, whether in South Africa or, with, or whether within uh, you know, such resistance uh, communal uh, groups such as the Black Lives Matter movement and others. Palestinians have to be at the heart of this conversation and they have to steer this conversation and move it forward. But it doesn't mean that un because until now we do not have a leadership that champions a one state solution, the civil society groups and the solidarity community stands bewildered and unable to advance the interests of the Palestinian people. So really good points there. Let me just add to that here in the about uh, what's happening here politically in the United States. There's a perception here in America uh, and the way that the tide seems to be going is amongst uh, those who are political candidates or those who are holding office, uh, which is ultimately the folks that we want to make the changes that we need um, in order to, to move the issue of Palestine in the right direction. Because as you know, the US has a profound influence on this issue. Uh, but there's this perception that if you support the two state solution as a politician, if you say, hey, the settlements are bad, I support the two-state solution, and suddenly you're a progressive and you're and you're dovish on this issue, and you're 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 on the right side of things. Uh, my response to that is is that is actually the most dangerous element of this entire issue. It's very easy to deal with folks who are on the right who say who don't even want to speak about anything Palestinian or a Palestinian state, who don't want to stop the settlements and so forth. 
But these so-called individuals who, who talk about uh, Palestinian rights and so forth, but at the same time are advocating for something that is no longer or is never even on the table as far as a two-state solution, hurt the Palestinian issue even more. And what is even more harmful is the fact that you have many Palestinian Americans or people who are advocates of the Palestinian cause supporting these candidates and supporting these, these individuals who are taking this stance. I, I, you know, for me, this is uh, uh, something that is very dangerous because it creates this illusion. And this is one of the biggest issues that the Palestinian uh, cause has faced is this illusion of a two-state solution, which has never been on the table in the first place. And when we support these types of candidates who are ultimately going to get into office and are ultimately going to going to make the policies that affect the people over there, uh, when you support these individuals, you're 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 basically uh, uh, supporting an endless pit of uh, nothingness when it comes to solving this issue. And so I think this all, first of all, begins with the Palestinian, um, the Palestinian community in the United States. Uh, we talk about what Israel does, and, and Israel has done a lot of things, but we can also do things here as well. We have to take initiative. We have to take uh, we have to take leadership. There are many uh, amazing and, 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 and prominent and, and uh, very smart Palestinians that, that can do this. But I think as a premise, what we need to do is we need to hold uh, individuals and institutions accountable. Where are you on this issue? Are you an advocate of a rights-based solution? If you are, we support you. If you're not, if you're going to keep wishy-washing about this idea of a two-state solution, you're just hurting the Palestinian cause as much as these right-wing individuals are. And so organizations like J Street, which supposedly identify this idea of, of uh, Palestinian suffering and so forth, and they talk about the settlements, ultimately th their idea is in order for Israel to continue to exist as a Jewish state, there must be some sort of truncated Palestinian state. And but there is no opportunity for a truncated Palestinian state, which means that the, the issue is, is perpetual. It's not going to end. We need to support institutions. We need to support candidates. We need to support scholars who understand the reality of the situation on the ground is that we already have a single state. And it's just a matter of giving Palestinians the, the opportunity for, for uh, dignity and human rights for them and, and, and for their children. And so these are the, the uh, I think as a Palestinian uh, American here in the United States, this is something that I've been uh, at least uh, trying to work for um, for, for a while now is, is to, to, to present to people uh, the reality of the situation and, and that uh, if we keep going down this uh, hole of two state solution, we're never gonna get anywhere. It's a mirage, it's a red herring and it's something that's not gonna get us anywhere. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Shahadeh. This was a very good uh, panel. I'm uh, afraid we're running, we ran out of time, and um, we apologize for some of the attendees if we couldn't get to all their questions. But uh, thank you for an excellent panel. Thank you for the panelists. This uh, was very informative. And I will pass the baton on to Adib. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reem. Thank you, our panelists, for your insights and thank you for your analysis and information. It was invaluable in the struggle for peace and with justice, with equality. And uh, also I wanna thank all of our attendees for attending as well as our co-sponsors. And I would like to this, take this opportunity to thank them and list them by name. American Friends Services Committee, American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, Appalachian Peace Education Center, Arab American Association of Central Virginia, Episcopal Peace Fellowship National Capital Regional Chapter, Jewish Voice for Peace, DC Metro, National Arab American Women's Association, Virginia Coalition for Human Rights, Voices from the Holy Land. And before we end, I just want to answer one question, if you permit me, because I saw a couple of attendees asking it, is that why don't you uh, request that Israel conduct an investigation into the killing of Shirin Abu Akla, being that this 
conferences in honor of Shireen Abu Akla, because Israel is incapable. You cannot ask the murderer to investigate the murder. I don't hear any voices asking the Russians to investigate what happened in Kharkiv or in Mariupol. What needs to be done is by an international independent investigators. Israel is incapable, period. And I would end right there and just want to tell our uh, attendees that we will be taking uh, a brief break, half an hour for lunch. And you can uh, join in by clicking on the same link that you joined in with this panel uh, at 12.30. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. And thank you again to our panelists. And we look forward to uh, working together with you in the future. Thank you again.